of all of the important committees in their parish, the parish council, the marriage ministry, the youth ministry, the Bible study leaders, the faith formation director, and especially looked for members of the Filipino community, and they went and met with them one-on-one. -on -one. And they asked them how they were being impacted by housing and the increasing um, cost of housing in the community. And what they found was that, yes, it was true that many of the Filipino families owned homes already, but many of, but those homeowners, many of them who are now in their 50s and 60s, when we think about the people who are leading our ministries, often, uh, especially in Catholic parishes, it's older folks, they had grown children who they had expected would be able to move back into the community. And we're finding that, that now the cost of housing was so big, uh, was getting so expensive that their children weren't able to move back into the community. And so their kids were moving an hour away, an hour and a half away, two hours. And these family structures were set up where the older parent, the grandparents were hoping to be able to take care of their grandkids so that their adult children could work. They wanted to have their families all together. And they were realizing that the high costs of housing in the community were not worth it and were untenable for their bigger family structure and values. And so through doing these one-on-one -on -one conversations, the Latino families found that they actually really had some strong allies in the Filipino community. And they were able to build enough support to come back to the pastor and say, the parish will be behind you if you support us in this initiative. And so through that work, they were able to um, do this uh, candidate forum that they held in the parish hall, the same one he'd been raising money for. You can see they had very new equipment up there. And they got all eight candidates in their town who were running for mayor to come to the parish hall. And of course, they didn't endorse any candidates because that would be completely illegal. But they said to them, we want, our community wants to hear about your vision for housing. Will you get up and share with us your vision for affordable housing in our community? And then very politely after each candidate had spoken, they said to that candidate, will you support our commitment to an affordable housing policy for the city? Yes or no? Can you please, just to be very clear, can you answer yes or no? And each candidate got up because they had, as you can see, 300 people at this forum each candidate got up and said yes. Um, and uh, last year they passed an affordable housing policy through their town. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how they did that. They did that not by going out and telling different families in the communities that housing was important. They didn't go out and make announcements at mass or, or at services. They didn't try and put up posters they literally had a team of 10 people who drew a map of the community and said, I will talk to the head of the marriage council. I will talk to the head of faith formation. And then once they had talked to those people, they said to those people, can I come into your faith formation class? And can we spend 20 minutes where we divide everybody in the class and ask them to turn to the person next to them and tell them about how housing is impacting their lives? Because the reality is that a lot of us are having hard experiences around housing. I'll be honest with you, me and my husband right now, we are a young couple. We would like to start a family. We're realizing in the midst of COVID-19, uh, he just got his degree. He was hoping to get a job. We're realizing we cannot afford to, leave, to uh, raise a family in Los Angeles. Uh, we are probably gonna end up moving out of this county. Um, I think a lot of people look at you know, a white professional family and think that we don't have these issues, we have these issues. These are things that are impacting all of our families, but we don't tend to talk about it. And the place where we create a safe space to do that is in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And of course, our faith communities are experts at helping people feel safe um, to be able to talk about what's really going on in their lives. So what does this actually look like? I'm going to stop my screen share for a second, and I'm going to put in the chat box the link to this document that I have up here. I'm gonna ask everybody if you can click on the link so that you can look at the document.
Does everybody know how to do that? Is everybody able to do that? Yes. Yeah, I'm clicking on it, but mine for some reason hadn't opened up yet. All right, if there are any problems, I'll go ahead and share it on my screen in case you need that. That might be better, Annie. Okay. I think we've got some folks where they can't find it. Right. I see it and I'm hitting it, but it's not opening. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. You got to open the chat function. Did you open the chat function, Pam? That's why I'm in the chat. Oh. In the chat function. Okay. Is everybody seeing it one way or the other now? You should say something big and pink yeah. that says Faith Doing Justice? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we call these conversations one on one, one to one, or sometimes called encounter conversations. And they basically have four goals they help us build relationships. They help us figure out who in our community is actually interested in an issue like housing. It helps us understand what gets them concerned. Um, and it can help us also understand the larger goals and concerns of a group of people. So these conversations are intentional. They are not just something that happens on the fly at coffee hour. We really need them to be a set space where there's some privacy they may be in a big room, but we want to make sure they're in a big room where nobody else is listening so that they're a little safer than other conversations. And they're extended because we're going to get into some deep topics. And they basically have four parts. One, we introduce ourselves, obviously, right? Uh, why you're there, say that you're part of a committee. I, as a young woman, I always try and make sure somebody knows that I'm not here to ask them out. This isn't a date, right? And usually we want to say, the pastor suggested that you're someone I talked to. We really wanted to get your thoughts on this campaign we're doing. We, we explain why them. And part of that is we want to explain why we think they're important to us in this work. And then, as modeled by Jesus in the Gospels, we share a story. And I want to really emphasize the importance of story. We often think of that we should share the statistics of how many folks are experiencing homelessness in our community. Or we say, I have this general concern. But as I talked about before, those things don't tend to stick as much as story. And then once we've shared our story, hopefully that opens up some space for the other person to share, will naturally tend to share some things back at us. It'll remind them of an experience they had. They'll kind of share their reactions. And if not, we might start to ask them some questions. What brought them to the city? What brought them to this parish? Are they concerned about housing, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of the conversation, we issue an invitation. We invite them to a meeting. Maybe a story about somebody else came up and we ask them, could you introduce them to me? Um, we really want to make sure we're engaging them in action because as you guys move forward and you might have vigils or rallies or things like that, people who have been engaged in this work are more likely to show up in the moments when you really need them, when they feel like they've been part of it. Include her and I don't know how to get it. No, she's not included yet. Okay, so the big thing that I have emphasized is telling your story. So I want to just talk about like what actually is a story, y'all? How is a story different than a report or an article? Usually life-based, something maybe that has to do with your life. Great, yep. What'd you say, Bert? It's, it's not boring like facts and statistics are. Okay, yeah, it's not facts and statistics, which usually makes it more interesting. It, it usually hooks you, like you start reading a newspaper and they always start with a story, you know? That's true, it's like, yeah. It's like, wow, okay, I think I want to read the rest of this and find out what happens, you know? Yeah. It, it yep. gets you wanna, makes you want to learn more. Yep. Anything else? There's usually a character and they yes. usually have some problem and that yes. find some 
well, hopefully resolution too. <laughs> yeah, they have characters and those characters have names, right? It's we often, and frankly, I think it's kind of gross sometimes how we will talk about people experiencing homeless as homelessness as like the others out there. Stories involve a person with a name and they also involve a place, right? It's very different to say, um, I got concerned about homelessness because I knew this lady who um, uh, was homeless for four months. No, I knew a woman named Beatrice. She ran a car mechanic shop. She had two daughters who were in high school. And when she and her two daughters had to move into her car mechanic shop, this is the impact it had on their family. And this is what that meant. But it got resolved because the church intervened and helped her to find housing. And now she's an advocate who helped pass affordable housing policies in her city, right? And that also kind of demonstrates the way stories have a beginning, a middle and an end, right? Sometimes they're not just like a resume of what happened in our lives. They have characters, they have spe specifics, they have places and they have a beginning, a middle and an end. And also they usually have a hero, right? So tonight we're gonna spend some time talking about what is the story that you wanna be telling to people to help explain your passion for housing. So I'm gonna invite you to spend about 10 minutes writing to yourself. Right. What is this? A, a, sorry? You want us to write to ourselves? Uh, you're just going to spend some time reflecting and writing, thinking about what is the story you want to tell. And so for me, the story is when is a moment that you realized you needed to fight for housing justice? And what happened in that moment? And I'm stressing the idea of a moment because I want you to think about a specific time in your life when something happened. Maybe it happened to you, maybe to a neighbor, maybe to a child, maybe to somebody you know through a program you worked in. But a moment when you realized something had to be done in this city to provide more affordable housing and solve this homelessness crisis. Not generalities of why you got interested, what was an experience you had or someone you knew had, okay? So I'll give you about 10 minutes to reflect on it and to write out to yourself, what was that story? And whoever has the host capabilities, can you go ahead and just um, mute most of us? That'll just give us all a little more freedom to reflect to ourselves. Okay. Thank you.
Do people feel about ready to come back together or do you need more time? Why don't you put on your fingers? You're like, good, you don't need more time or you need one minute, two minute, three minute, let's see, zero. Keep them up, keep them up for a second. We're good, we're good. Everyone's okay, ready. We're gonna take one more minute, I see. <clears throat> I think we're ready, Annie. Okay. Um, Jill, are you gonna put people in breakout rooms? Um, I can. Okay. So we're gonna take just about five minutes um, and in, just try and share the stories in pairs. I just need to know how many of us there are on the call. And I don't have a good sense of that here. So I'm not sure so how to do it. just need three nine rooms. Participants. Okay, nine participants. So I but need you just to... need, I don't think you need to do you, me, or Bert. You guys don't want to share your stories? Oh, no. at least I don't want. Okay, so we'll, we'll do eight then. Okay. Oh, no, we'll do four so, breakout groups. Four, yeah. four rooms. Okay. There. So everybody's in a room now, except Annie is not joined and Bert is not joined. So everybody should be seeing a pop up on their screen. You're going to join and you're just going to try sharing your story. So how do we know if people are in their group? People have to join, right? I don't know. Oh yeah, here it is. These two people are in that room, these two people are in this room, these two people are in this room. But you and I are together. We're in our we're in a room together. Where are we? I don't see us. Well, we're not one of the four rooms. We weren't included in that. You were not included. But everybody else ended up in a room. Okay. Okay. You won't. You you heard my story many times. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it that you would tell? I always talk about the kids mm -hmm. in the stars program and how we couldn't really um, uh, you know it was just so disappointing to see people leaving the community because they couldn't afford housing and to see all their their um you know to see all of their um apartment buildings being sold out from under them you know so i learned about affordable housing and that openings at a cafe court i just started with the families there and they all the stress is left parents finally had time for their kids and every one of those kids end up graduating from college. So I knew affordable housing had been very powerful. Mm -hmm. Something that was very transformational. And I, I want more of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your story, hon? Well, I usually talk about Melissa and Sean. And, um, and, you know, all of the efforts over the years to get them housed and have them work with churches and what they do advocacy and we do everything we could. Finally got them housed and after a year they had some very personal problems and they decided to leave. And that's when I got very upset when I realized that people who are chronically homeless need 
growing support of housing, not just housing. And I had been very naive in not realizing that. And now, I mean, that was what got me started uh, in advocacy work because I realized I'd spent so much time just trying to get one couple housed. And if there had been housing available for them earlier on, their lives would have been much different. Yeah. So uh, uh, the longer people are on the street, the harder it is to get them back into a housing situation, especially when they have, as in her case, serious physical handicap. Powerful, yeah. Yeah. So That's powerful. Yeah. Are you keeping track of time? I don't know how, how this is working. Well, when, when, you, uh, when the time is up, how, how do we you, know the close time? all rooms and, well, then, and then they come back. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't um, set the time. But we'd say about five minutes. But I didn't set the time. Okay, so why don't we go two more minutes? <laughs> so set the time for two minutes. You can just do one more minute. Two. Yeah. It's, it's eight o'clock. Okay. How are you doing? Um, it's hard to get used to all this technology. You know, it was pretty hard at the beginning, people yeah. not being able to join. Yeah. Well, some people have technical issues. Yeah, well, I want to make sure I, we work them through and I don't feel mm -hmm. neglected. Yeah. Well, so how do you undo this? What do you do? The press where it says close all rooms. Okay. I've never done it before, but I've seen that read. Okay, yeah. That's what it says. Okay. And it's kind of cool. I've never actually done it. It's, it has the names of everybody. They were arbitrarily picked. But I couldn't, I couldn't figure this out this morning. I couldn't get the right people into the right rooms. Yeah, that part of it is hard. hard. That's where I really needed support. You know, I would have to um, practice figuring out how to. I thought I had it organized, but I didn't do it right. <laughs> um. Oh, I see. Okay. So you can move people to different rooms. Right. That's how you do it. Okay. And I was trying to figure it all out to get people moved to the right room, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't figure it out. Okay. There, there you go. So, you can, so she's trying to talk. Can we close all rooms? Okay. I got it. Yeah, I could have helped you this way, but I know. Well, you were busy, huh? Okay, we're going to close the room. So... Um, how do we get people back? They're going to they're be back within about half a minute. How do you know that? Because it said closed rooms of 54 seconds. Oh, okay. So everyone's getting a warning now, and they have a minute to come back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chase had put in the chat that he needed to put his kids to bed. Did, did he? Was he able to say that before he went into the breakout room? I, I'm really unfamiliar with this technology. I have no idea. Hmm. I should have had someone else do this. Okay, it's right here. That's what he said. Okay. He said that uh, 10 minutes ago. Yeah, so, so um, it looks like he didn't get to share his story with anybody, and somebody was by themselves. Okay. Oh, oh well. okay. So I heard one of you ended up by yourself. Oh, well, technology is hard to master. Chase, did you get to put your kids to bed or do you still need to do that? Yeah, no, I just want, I, they're, they're not, they're not in bed yet, but I'll stick with you as long as I can. I got to, I got to share and, and hear from Brother James. So it was good. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Great. Awesome. I see smiles. <laughs> we just got oh. cut off, right, James? <laughs> <laughs> So if everyone can go ahead and unmute themselves, why don't we try and hear how was that for folks? 
Well, I'll tell you, so Pam and I were together um, and she had, um, I think we both had personal stories. Um, hers was a little more relative um, to her situation. Mine was actually, I, I actually met someone, We our church host, uh, Family Promise, and mm -hmm. there was a, uh, a girl who was there, a young teenager, and I found out that she went to high school with my daughter. And so mm -hmm. I said, oh, normally she comes with me. Do you want me to bring her with me the next time I come? Because we're usually there every night having dinner with them. And just, she was just like, no. Like the look on her face was no, absolutely not. And so I said, that's fine. She won't even know that you've been here. Like she won't, she won't be here. And my daughter always came with us. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, understanding the, the, the embarrassment, I think the shame of, you know, of not having, you know, a place to call your own was like, that just really spoke volumes to me. And then, you know, just saying, you know, and this is kind of what Pam and I were talking about is that, you know, sometimes you think about whether it's, you know, your livelihood versus someone else's is it me renting out my home less than what my mortgage is so that it can be affordable that's not necessarily the case it could be you know that we have you know um buildings or homes or or things that are are not being utilized that could be used for affordable housing yeah i think so often with housing we're taught we're made to feel that it's our fault right if if i can't afford housing it reflects that um you know I did something wrong in my career, or I didn't work hard enough, or I'm a failure. But I think often back to the foreclosure crisis, the mortgage crisis of 2009, when tens and hundreds of thousands of families were being told, it's your fault that you can't pay your mortgage. But if there are hundreds of thousands of families that can't pay their mortgage, the reality is there's something wrong with that mortgage system, right? Yeah. And yeah. here in Los Angeles, a lot of us are being told it's our fault if we uh, can't afford housing. But when hundreds of thousands of families can't afford housing, there is something wrong with our housing system. And so how do we tell stories that move us from private shame to public pain? Because it's when we are experiencing public pain that we're recognizing there is a system that is not our fault. And I think kind of the shame you revealed in that story just really highlights that. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one other person share, what was that like for them? <laughs> well, I guess I might as well be another book in to carry <laughs> uh, because it was personal. It was kind of personal to me because moving to Pasadena, well, moving from Mississippi mm -hmm. to California already. Sure, that's a but shock. knowing that the, I mean, uh, a, a, a million dollar home in Mississippi would probably only be worth about 50,000 maybe a hundred thousand in California. So coming here with everything being so high, trying mm -hmm. to find somewhere reasonable to rent was a challenge. Yeah. But then in my church, we've been losing a few of our members. And one of the reasons we've been losing a, lot, a few of our members is because they are renters and rent is constantly going up, 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 up to the point where they are, where they can't even afford to live there. And a lot of, we have a lot of older members that are renters. Mm. Uh, so trying to find somewhere for them to find that is affordable for them to rent is was it like impossible to the point that they've had to move all the way out to different other cities. Mm -hmm. So now a church that they've been going to and 
became a deaconette and been deacon in there for so many years. It's, it's a hardship on them to be able to try to stay involved in the church after having to move so far away just to find affordable housing. Yeah. So it, and that it, it shows how really it threatens works. the whole institution, right? And you're even yes. in existence. Yes. So I'm going to try and wrap up because I know um, uh, uh, Jill has another training for you. But I just want to encourage you to think about who are five people of influence in your congregation who you would want to go and have a one-to-one -one with? And people who you think if they are really bought in for this work around standing for affordable housing, they could help you get people to a vigil. They could help you get people to a city council meeting. Who are those five people? And to call them and say, can we have an hour to talk about housing? But in that hour, what I would really encourage you to do is to, is to share this story and don't share the story and say, therefore, will you work with me on affordable housing? Share this story and say, this is why I care about affordable housing. Can you tell me about you? Have you noticed stories? Have you noticed concerns? Because it's when we get them talking about why it's important to them, that's how we get them engaged in the long term. So I'll have um, Jill email you guys out uh, that document that kind of gives a little more of an outline of how to do this. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, hopefully she can include my contact information when we do that, or Bert will do that. Okay, cool? Awesome. Great. Good night, folks. Let's give, let's give Annie a big hand. You guys have any um, quick questions for her right now? Well, I'll make sure you get that information. Um, I'm going to share this. Um, I'm going to go have dinner. Good night, y'all. Okay, Bye -bye. enjoy your Bye. dinner. Thanks, Annie. Um, okay, so I wanted to go to this link, but I think I have to do a separate share to go to a link on the website, but I'm going to, I'm going to maybe do that another time since our time is pretty short right now. So we have the opportunity to look at what God has provided churches right before their nose to help address this crisis. And um, there's now seems to be almost a movement across the country to look at using excess land on church church property as an opportunity to build affordable housing. Um, so many, many affordable housing developers cannot find land. And so there's now a number of churches. There's seven in Pasadena. There's two churches already, one on North Fair Oaks that has 48 units. Uh, with a proposal ready to partner with an affordable housing developer and one in East Pasadena that's looking at maybe a hundred units. So, um, so it's happening, but there's a big problem and the problem is zoning. Uh, most of these churches are not properly zoned. So you need to change the density so it can be higher and you need to make sure it's zoned for residential. So, um, so, Instead of me kind of um, telling you all these things, I just want to have a brief, uh, if you can unmute yourselves, and, and just tell me why you think this might be a good idea to try to use congregational land. There's, there's, there's a lot of reasons, and it is, and one is when a developer buys property, they have to be paying on that the whole time, you know, until they get ready to actually build. That could be several years, several years down the road. So with a church, they already have the land. They'll get paid for that land if they want to do it as a ground lease or sell the land. It becomes uh, a revenue source for the church. But, um, but it's also the carrying costs, the insurance. So so if you've got land that's already paid for it's a huge help to make sure this gets done so it also churches it's kind of part of their mission to care for the um lower income populations it's not just kind of it's pretty central as if you 
you know, according to the devotion that, um, that uh, Bert gave us tonight, there's some congregations, and I know, um, I think it was Pam that mentioned, you know, people are leaving congregations, um, they're struggling. So how do you stay within mission and bless the community and love your neighbor? and try to keep that population close by that are, that are having to leave. Um, and it can also bring financial stability to, um, to these uh, churches that are struggling. Um, and it can also, um, churches sometimes aren't that busy during the week. And so this is a way to utilize the prop property 24 um, seven. And there's often in churches, a, natural social services reaching out in love to care for those in need and so you've got people then right next door where you can be blessing them um so during this whole covid thing it's just there's estimates that up to 20 uh, 250,000 uh, new homeless will be in the u.s up to 20 a 45 percent increase in homelessness and we were already in a severe housing crisis even before all of this. And um, so, so we, we really, this could create local jobs. There's a lot of good things about how affordable housing on church land can help in the recovery of COVID. Um, so in the housing element, uh, we talked about that in our last training and it's this big document that every city has to plan for sufficient housing for all income levels. And so you can see here for the city of Pasadena, how many, how many uh, units we have to, during this next eight year cycle, the city has to supply 9,409 units. That's a whole lot of housing they've got to figure out where to build and put. Um, and of that 9,000, 27, or 2,739, that's the highest number there, well, other than above moderate. But how are they gonna build that very low income housing? They're gonna have to have land that they can build that on to help lower the cost of, of building this. So um, I'm gonna also talk about just what we're proposing. Then I, you're all gonna talk among each other again of how you would talk to your neighbor, your friend, or your pastor about this. So this is essentially what we're asking for, to permit housing to be on existing congregational property in the city, whether zoned residential, commercial, or public. And, um, and so right now, uh, churches, there's not one church in the city that's properly zoned. They need to become residential if they're not yet, or they need to have higher density. So this would kick in if at least 50% of the units are affordable that, that would be built. So that I, you don't need to understand the averaging of all those units to be affordable, but basically that it has to be at least 50% of the units affordable. And if it's commercial or residential or commercial or public zone, it would also add residential. That's essentially it right there. That's the policy we're asking for. And, um, and this is what the increased density would look like. Um, if your church is zoned in a residential neighborhood, you'd be able to do change it to 30 or uh, 32 units per acre. If it's already 32 units, it would go to 64. If it's 48, it would go to 87 units per acre and so forth. So this, this is, um, you don't need to know all these numbers. All you need to know is that we need to have the density increased, which will then make it feasible to build affordable housing. So there's a lot of steps. I've made this awfully small for you to see, but right now it's not on the city council agenda. It was in March and then they pulled it off. So we need to learn this proposal, be able to articulate it, talk about it and get it back on the agenda. How do we do that? We ask the planning commission and the city council uh, to make a priority and to get it also into the housing element. So this coming Wednesday is a planning commission meeting and we can write letters and we can say, we want this policy to be part of the housing element. Um, 
And so the planning department needs to do their studies and research because our congregational land committee has just a tremendous amount of expertise. They've already done most of the research for the city. So they're offering to give that to the city for free to help jumpstart this policy in their research. Um, and then we just, after that, once it gets onto the city council agenda, we just need to keep flooding letters. From each of your churches, we need to have at least 10 letters that would come from your churches to support this. You might write an article about it. There's a church in Pasadena, the Salvation Army Church, that's now gonna have 69 units that was just, well, it was a, it'll, it'll be approved this, this next city council meeting, I think. Or has it already been approved? I think there's one more step. There's one more step to get that approved. So that church is, is gonna be able to bless 69 homeless people with a home on their excess land. Bill Wong, our housing director, was talking to them. They were they have a food distribution center. And he just said, well, what are you gonna do on top of that? You know, you've got space above that, your zone, that you can actually have units. And I said, oh, we never thought of that. And so eventually it led to them coming up with a whole proposal and, they, and it's really close to getting approved. So you could talk about that. You could talk about other churches you may know that have built on their property. You make announcements, you put articles in the newspaper that could be written. And then when it comes to, when it actually gets on the agenda again, and we have a chance to get it passed, that's when we just bring, that's not crows, we're supposed to say crowds, so forgive me. <laughs> We bring crowds to the city council and then we celebrate. We have a big That's party. Mm -hmm. and we get it passed. Can we bring doves and pigeons? <laughs> I know, instead of crows. <laughs> you can see my, and then it takes a lot of prayer. You know, here's Angie, one of the liaisons, as we're praying for her. And, and this is something you can be praying for as churches that this would get passed. We've had many prayer yeah. vigils. So I'm gonna take these last few minutes and talk about a sandwich. So the sandwich is basically made up of the stories you told just now tonight. That's the bread, okay? So, you know, you, and then in between are some of these facts. And so I, I, I just want us to reiterate, what are some of the facts that you just heard? Why is this a good idea and what is the proposal? Anybody that wants to share that so we can review what we said. Um, from what I heard you say is that it, it's a good idea because um, the developers would need to acquire land, but if it's on a church property, they already have the land. So it makes it a lot easier and more accessible for them to build um, housing there, as well as um, it creates a community where people who, if, if it's a particular uh, type of housing, like supportive um, housing, the church can be involved in the support of those residents who are um, occupying those units. So it's it's like a win-win because this is something that the church should be doing. It's helping people in need in, in the first place. It's also creating community and that's what church is. It's, just, it's a community and um, it, they're also um, um, kind of going along with the principles of what um, Jesus had said is to help those who are in need. Yeah, love your neighbor. That's excellent. That's powerful what you shared, June. That's really powerful. What else did people hear? Anything else? Any facts? Well, 50% of the units would have to be affordable, yes. um, which, is, which is good as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the actual proposal? 50% of the units to be affordable, and what else did you guys hear? Hmm. Remember, if, you're, if your property is zoned, either... Uh, um, the, the, 
the the public zoning, I mean, there had to be a zoning overlay. So you had to do the density, the, the density thing where if you had 32 units, it would be increased to like uh, 64 or 60 or whatever it was. Yeah. So you have to increase the density to make it feasible. And then remember when we talked about um, that some some churches don't even have, they're not even so zoned for residential. If it's zoned for commercial or mm -hmm. or, or um, public or semi-public, then it would add residential to the to the so that's, that's the zoning overlay, right? The zoning overlay we're asking for is to change it so that residential is certainly part of the zoning and then to increase the density. It's really essentially those two things uh, that make it feasible to do this. So, um, so does that affect the um, tax um, status of a church? If it's no, if it's, I, I don't know if a tax, if a church is considered commercial property, um, but for if, if it became residential, does that have any impact on the um, tax exempt status? That's an excellent question. And so when you actually get to partner with affordable housing developer, they make sure that, it, that the church is a separate entity that will not affect the church at all. Um, and then any taxes that, that the residential has to pay will all be taken care of by the development partner. They're the ones that run the whole program. They manage it. So you, the church doesn't need to be involved and they don't even need to be involved with paying the taxes, but they would get, if they do a ground lease, they would get some revenue and that would be good for the church, but they, they, they would not need to worry about taxes. So, yeah. Can I add something that, um, just really quickly, one of two things. One is the mayor is very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, your sound went out. Yeah, your sound, you. sound went out. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Mayor Tornick is very enthusiastic about this. Joe took him on a tour of some of the churches in Northwest Pasadena, and he was very, very impressed. So he's behind it 100%. Yeah. The other thing is if sometimes neighbors object to affordable housing, they're afraid, but if it's something that the church is doing, there's probably going to be a little more trust. And that was and true in the case the of the Salvation Army Hope Center, because the Salvation Army has a good reputation in the neighborhood. Uh, the Neighborhood Association was a little more open to trusting that this would be done in a proper way that would be safe for the neighborhood. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks. So, so we're, I have a question. Because, yeah. because I heard you say that that once it was done, that the, the developer would actually run the units and everything and take care of all of that. Now, my question, my question is, is, is would there be like, um, would the church have a seat on the board or, or have a, or have a part in the decision making of, of the of the units and and the progress of the units and stuff? Once they would, once they start renting them out and everything. Would the church actually have a have a part of the decision making as far as running the units? It's an excellent question. And I think with our congregational land committee, I hope you go to the Making Housing a Community Happen website and look at the congregational land committee because what it does, it it takes the church, like it, it was about a six month process we went through with new new life. And uh, we took the cues and the process from the church. The church was passionate. They could hardly wait to get their proposal together. But some churches may want to be involved. Other churches are not interested in that. So in this process, we, we, we put together a proposal and then questions for potential developers that will help them see what the church wants. If they want to stay involved, they can. If they don't want to, they don't have to. And so it, it's, it, if, if they want to stay involved, then they better tell that to their developer, their potential developer, because they need to find a developer that would be willing to do that. Um, there's a United Methodist Church down in, in Santa Ana, and um, they clearly wanted to stay involved. And so they interviewed three potential developers, and there was only one that, that 
was interested in what the church wanted as far as their, the, re, you know, to remain involved. And so you really, it's, it's about a six month discernment process as the church thinks through all of this and what they want and what God's calling them to do and what's feasible and, and if it's even possible, you know. Um, so we can go another time if you'd like and go into this more detailed, but for now, um, we're kind of out of time and yeah, I know. Tell them about it. So, so, um, for now, um, I'm, I'm hoping I've got a sample letter that I'd like to send to, to Bert to have you write to send to the planning commission for this coming Wednesday and, and share why you would support this. Um, and then there's going to be a more full explanation of this at our monthly GPOG meetings, which is part of being a liaison member. You know, you need to participate in those monthly meetings. We're calling them monthly housing justice forums. So the chair of our committee for congregational land will be presenting that night. And um, so you can learn more. And this is where it's important you try to get your pastor there or other pastors you know, so they can be part of this. It will be recorded, but it's so much better when it's live. Anthony mentioned the mayor. He's actually going to be there on Tuesday. Um, he's excited about learning our proposal. Now, the thing that makes what, what the mayor is not 100% behind yet is what's called by right. And what that means, it's automatic. It's not discretionary. It's where if a church wants to do this, they're given permission to do it without having to go through an onerous change of zoning, without having to go through the expense of that. It will probably be $100,000 less in the project if we get the zoning fix, and it probably cut a year off of the process and getting it built. So this is really important. It's not gonna get passed unless every church in the city stands and, and supports it. Whether they want to do this or not, they can stand with other churches wishing to do it and say, yes, let's let our city's churches be blessing to our community and, and supply some additional housing units. And Jill, so you were saying that he is for that um, or he, you're saying he is not for that? He is totally for the zone change. We're not we're not sure if he's really supporting yet the by right part of it, that it would be automatic. And so that's where we just need to pray. You know, only God can change hearts. Right. And, and, uh, and, and, and he'll be there. He'll hear your questions. He'll hear your stories. So you might want to tell some of your stories on Tuesday and put them in chat and share, and he'll be looking at all that, you know? Um, so, Jill, can I make yeah. a, uh, I, I was talking this morning and we had a morning meeting and I was talking with um, uh, Cynthia Kurtz, who used to be the uh, manager for the city of Pasadena. And what she explained to me, basically, this is, this is kind of very, for those of us that, that don't, aren't in the field and don't know the technical language, there's three ways of doing this overlay. And one of them would be by right, where the church just had get gets the increased zoning, no, you know, no process, they just can do it. The other one's sort of in between where they can do it unless somebody has a really good reason they can't do it. And then there's a third way where they can do it, but really only if the neighborhood says, okay, you know, kind of like three different categories. There's probably more than that, but that's kind of the three. And I think Mayor Tornick is probably in one of the first two. And, I, and we want in, in the other one, in, in the, in yeah. the, by right, you know, yeah, you know, we want him to be uh, where we where churches can just do it. Um, yeah, he's probably, you know, that's probably where he is. There's a state policy that's wanting to make this possible on any church in the state, um, and and that's pretty huge. You know, I, I don't know if that'll get passed or not, but um, there's definitely a momentum, and we would be the first city to pass something like this. I think all eyes are on Pasadena right now to see what we're going to do. Um, and then other cities, once we have a good ordinance, other cities can adopt it, you know. Um, I want to respect our time. What I really wanted was to create a sandwich before we left, but I want to respect your time. If you're willing to have someone do that for the next few minutes, the sandwich would be basically tell a little of the story you told earlier 
and then and then explain this policy and how why you're excited about it and then end with a bit more of the story so um i don't know if you want to take those extra few minutes um i think you need to leave if you you know this is the time we allotted but if there's anyone that anyone wants to stay on and just try to do that i'd love to hear how you can create your your sandwich of the story facts and story um anyone well, courageous i have to go you have but, to go okay thank thanks everyone. so much james, right, james. Yeah. Thanks. I'm leave now. Okay. okay you guys are right. great good thanks. questions thanks, great to be with you okay. thanks you too. all right bye bye carrie bye so so thanks you guys did you did any of you want to try to tell uh, reiterate that trudy or pam or do you need to go right now i trudy, think you're you're, you're, you're um, let's unmute you, you. There you go. we can hear yeah, you, you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna leave also okay great thanks okay. Trudy. it's good to thanks see you so much thank you God bless All you right. guys. Thanks. Right, take care. Bye bye. Well, so, I mean, <laughs> do you want to try? I mean, come up from my story as far as uh, how I feel about the elders in my church having to move and not have anywhere to stay because the rent is just too extravagant out here in Pasadena. But if we did have affordable housing out here, then more of my church members wouldn't have to leave the church and leave all the way out of the area to find affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So that really would be a, a, an incentive to really why I would like to push that they do have open up more affordable housing here in Pasadena so yeah. that we would have to look who's at, at no at my church i don't know how about other churches but i'm sure probably there are probably uh other parishioners that's having to move out of the area too for the same reasons yeah not able to find affordable housing yeah and i think you're at lincoln avenue right pam right yes, yes. so you guys have got some land you know it's possible that this could be done on your property there's other churches close by that might be able to do it as well but you've got a nice big parking lot and and you could maybe build over the parking lot you know yeah. and so it's it's not but impossible this is it. happening yeah you know? so yeah so you could say that that's why know? i care i you know that's why i care was asking as far as the tax responsibility and stuff because they that could be something that our church could look into consider. doing. Yeah. Consider. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be just what you shared would be great to share in a letter. You know, you could write that down and just okay. say, you know, I, I don't know if our church would decide to do this, but we've got a lot of property. And if, and if God should direct us, we certainly would like the opportunity to get this yeah. passed. Um, and we we don't want to prevent other churches from being able to do this okay, you know yeah, so we right. want to support the zone change you know we yeah. want to see the zone change yeah. you know yes. so um yeah so i'm gonna okay. i'm gonna send information to uh, bert about the meeting okay. on wednesday and tuesday so hopefully you guys can all come and hopefully you can get constance okay your yes. past first lady uh, and, uh, yes and if <laughs> yes. you can encourage them both to show up that'd be awesome so i sure will i sure will well wednesday wednesday is our prayer meeting nights yeah so you don't need I to don't... go to the meeting on wednesday but you can write a letter anytime before then and but on oh, tuesday, okay. night, tuesday night is the meeting is is where okay. i'd like them to try to come yeah. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Tuesday okay. night's right. meeting where we want people to come to, but Wednesday yeah. the city meeting. But it's okay. great to meet you on the. On right. the yes. I can hardly wait. It's great to meet you to too. Meet with, okay. <laughs> great. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Oh, thank right. you for. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Pam. Okay. Bye bye. So um, there we go. So Bert. 
<laughs> it was a rough start at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we had uh, June and uh, Trudy come in later. I don't know when they came in. I, well, well, June I texted me, but I don't know when Tr Trudy kind of came in there somewhere. Yeah, and it, you know when when we're sharing, uh, uh, the when we're doing a share, I don't I don't have access to see that someone's in the waiting room. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's because the whole screen is covered. So right. I was so glad that you texted me or that you, you, you know, somehow communicate with me so I would yeah. know to admit them. Yeah, June texted me. That's how I knew. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, there's um, supposed to be a little pop-up at the bottom or at the top that says uh, someone's in the waiting room. But you have to be aware of it. And maybe I was just oblivious. Yeah, yeah, I'm so tired today. Yeah, you, you know, it, it does pop up to let you know. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah who knows? I'm sure... Um, yeah, probably, I bet you Gilbert and Duran probably tried to call in. Uh, yeah. They've had problems getting in before. Gilbert told me he was going to, and Duran, I think, said he was going to. No. Oh. Well, I, I Duran kept... I, said Tuesday. What's that? Duran might have said Tuesday. I can't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you've been able to talk to Gilbert. I've been worried about him. Is he okay? Yeah, we, yeah, we had like a two and a half hour conversation. I know he's a real talker. I think he's lonely. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's doing okay. His older brother is in hospice. Oh uh, my! So his older brother is, is in. He's in Alabama, I think, or oh, wow, or maybe, maybe somewhere somewhere in the south. Um, but um, no, I think he's in Houston now. Houston mm -hmm. or Dallas. Anyway. Um, he, he's in hospice, but he's like in his eighties. So I think, yeah. you know, it's, but, uh, and I don't think it's not COVID. It's just some other things. Um, but so he's been dealing with that, but, um, but otherwise he's doing fine. He's very, he's, he's definitely taking care of himself. He's very aware he's in a high risk. High risk. Yeah. And so well, I learned something really interesting from, um, Pastor John Stewart, um, mm -hmm. yesterday he called me and we were talking and I was saying, you know, reach out to Gilbert. I think he, he needs the support right now. You know, he says, yeah, I want to give him a call. And I said, you know, I think he's pretty discouraged about his church because mm -hmm. it's a nonprofit called Triangle that, that actually owns it. And so, yeah, I'm done. It's done. Yeah. And, um, and John Stewart, he said, well, I'm on that board. He's on the board. Really? So he's on wow. the board for Triangle. And so so he and John is like hook, line, and sinker for this, you know, building on church property. So he might he might be able to play a pretty significant role on, on the board for Triangle. So I think it's important that 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 Gilbert know that and and kind of be encouraged. But um right. but when we called his pastor, he said, No, I don't want to go to any of this stuff. You know. Oh, really? Yeah, he's really against it. He has mm -hmm. pipe dreams that this church of three or four people is going to somehow grow. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, one, one thing I'm doing with uh, Gilbert is I've been um, going over to the Covenant Church where the uh, job center is, is packaging food for workers. Mm. Um, and I've, I've been trying to encourage them to do better with their social distancing because I don't want us to be a opportunity, you know, yeah. a virus to spread while we're trying to do something good. And um, they, and they are doing better, but Gilbert said he was willing to come down and give them a 15, 20 minute talk. Oh, uh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So, I, and that'd be great. That would be great for them because they would hear it from a doctor. Yes. And be yeah. great for him because it gives him feel like he can do something, you know. So. Yes. That's perfect. You're really such a great connector. You're doing such a good job. I'm trying. I mean, you, you started stuff, so you, you, you've <laughs> a lot of, that. of these connections are already yours. So, Well, I, I, I tried to make it simple and practical tonight after this great training that Annie did. And I, I have got to be reminded to record. I didn't start the recording till later. Oh, really? When, when did you record it now, Joe? Oh, I didn't realize. I, I'm too tired to be involved in all this technology and, and be thinking about everything. Yeah. I, there's a way to, to change this so that.